All right, boys and girls. Boys and girls, welcome. Welcome in. Hey, 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 hey. Tonight, tonight is a chill evening. Tonight is an evening of something very special to me, actually. Uh, this is a hobby that I've picked up in the, in the, in the most recent of times, and that is the customization of keyboards. I just, I love keyboards. It's a thing that I can't explain. I No, I can't explain it. I can explain it in, 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 in great detail. Um, where do you start? Where do you start? So keyboards, I want to say, are basically uh, your gateway into the virtual space that is your your computer, the world, the internet, all of this. It's your the per, your peripheries are essentially your interface into into this world. Now, I I come from the mechanic world. I'm a mechanic. I work on cars, and uh, when you work on cars. As a hobbyist, you know, tools are the thing you try to acquire to get you get your hands on them. When you're a professional, just the, the hobbyist tools don't cut it. You got you you need a better feel for for things. And uh, this is why mechanics go overboard in buying their tools, especially hand tools. You get the the cream of the crop, and there's so many personal preferences when it comes to this. And uh, it's it's no different. It's no different when it comes to computers. You know, when you you're interfacing with this this virtual space and this virtual world, this computer and everything that's going on inside of it, uh, those things that you're actually interfacing with, your peripherals, should be the most comfortable things you have, right? Am I right? I mean, that's just my opinion. Uh, but and, and let me let me tell you, people get very opinionated when it comes to the types of switches and feel and how much lubricant and how little lubricant. All these things, all these things. Now let's I can just, let's just get into the bare bones of it, right? Now a mechanical keyboard is essentially. A PCB inside of a case, a printed circuit board, that when you make contact with with the with with the circuits and you you complete the circuits, it sends electrical signals to the computer to say, "Hey, this is the button that you pressed." Pretty pretty straightforward, right? Now there there are a bunch of different ways that they construct these things. Um, most keyboards that you'll find. Uh, at your store or in your laptops or the ones that just come with your computer they're put together and they're called uh, what they call a membrane keyboard where it's just it's a PCB and then they have this silicon rubberized membrane that goes over these little divots and inside the divots there's a little carbon piece and when you depress the divot it comes down and it makes contact and then boom, boom there you go now the reason why they use those instead of mechanical keys, it's, it's a lot cheaper to produce. Now, mechanical keys are the things that is sought after. Um, people want this, and again, where all the, all the points of preference are. But the beautiful thing about them is uh, the, the feel for them. I mean, it's, they're actually mechanical keys. So rather than that membrane that I was explaining, on the PCB, on the printed circuit board, they'll just have a few holes for switches to be soldered onto. Now these are the switches. See if that will autofocus, focus you fun thing, right? So these little guys are the switches and inside they, they're constructed out of a few different parts, right? And you can see there's the two contacts that come down come down there and uh inside there's a little spring 
there's a leaf where those contacts are and there's the stem and the stem has a ramp on it where the ramp will come down and uh, push the leaf together to make the contacts contact and there are different ways you can put keyboards together there's ones where those contacts are soldered onto the PCB there's more um, easily swappable ones where the PCB has quick connects, little spring-loaded um, insert slots where those contacts can slide through and make a contact and you can remove them and change them at will. I mean, if you do it enough times, you'll wear out that part itself. But yes, it's all about the feel and how does it feel to press the keys and how does it sound and what is the sensation of pressing keys it's uh it, you, it, you can easily get obsessed over it you really can but it's a lot of fun it's a great hobby um it's, there's a lot of work to it and tonight i'm gonna do some of that work so tonight the main goal my main goal is to relax relax is the main goal <laughs> but other than relaxing um i'm gonna take some of these switches that i acquired now let me explain a little bit i've built this keyboard so this is my HyperX keyboard uh i was i was kind of happy with it i liked it it had the cherry mx reds in it and they were, they were nice switches, but I was really curious. Hey, what does it feel like to have lubricated switches? And I was really curious about that. So what I did was I, I bought a little tiny micro keyboard. Now I'm also into, happen to be into a game called Os, and we could get into that sometime if you'd like uh os that game is amazing but i have this little keyboard that i use for os and i'll just unplug it here it's got some leds in it nice thing about this little keyboard is it's got two switches only well two switch two mechanical switches it's got a few uh little momentary divot membrane switches you looked a lot different there. four years ago i did I did look a lot different. I got the I gotta turn this down so it's not quite as loud. Trash sniper. Good to see you, man. Good to see you. Yeah, I did look a lot different. I was a younger man and I had a lot less stress from career and children at the time. But hey, I'm feeling good. I hope I'm I hope I'm looking good. But I was just explaining about how I'm get I've gotten myself into this hobby of mechanical keyboards and how amazing it is. Um, so I got this little hobby keyboard for, it was for a, a game called Os, and it's a rhythm game where you use a, use a stylus pen and two keys on your keyboard. But I wanted to try out the different types of switches and the different feels for all the different switches. And the, the really cool thing about this little unit here is that it's a hot swappable unit. So you can actually take the keys out and then swap them to whatever you want to try. Just pop them in like that. And Bob's your auntie. You're off to the races. You're pressing other switches. That's that's just the the main the main concept there. So the cool thing was I got to try out a bunch of different feels for switches and then that's that's when that's when I went down the rabbit hole and I'm like oh man let me let me see what else is out there what other options are available for switches and then I got into even more fine things like the the springs in the switches and what it's like to have lubricated switches. And then that brought me to what I built here. Now I, I built this with um, some Gateron blue, well Gateron, not 
blue switches, but they're they're like robin's egg blue colored switches, and they're linear switches, and they came with uh, 60, 63 gram springs, and I got reading on springs. Like I got I dorked out on it, right? Because I know spring rates when it comes to cars. I know spring rates for like even aftermarket like four by fours and lowered vehicles, stuff like that. So I was like, spring rate, that's right up my alley. What kind of spring rate can we get on a keyboard switch? And that's where I decided to really dive in. But before we get any too yeah, far into this. Yeah, Sue is pretty fun. I remember telling you to play Centipede. Also nice keyboard. Wish I had a PC. Oh, dude. Osu is really fun. It's a great game. I got I got hooked on it. I'm like absolutely just I'm worried about playing it on YouTube though. If I stream it here, I may wonder if I'll get in trouble. I'd rather not get in trouble. So I'm gonna do a bit more research on that. But yeah, I was explaining earlier. This is a this is actually a HyperX keyboard. I, I took it all apart and desoldered the switches. It was a big ordeal. A lot of work, but so worth it in the end, right? Um, and I put these switches in. But getting into basically the keyboard hobby. Um, where was I? I had a... That's it. There we go. So these these are your your main trio of switches right here, right? So you have your Cherry MX Blues or the clicky switches as as they're known as. And uh, this is the one that gets the bad rap from from people in the keyboard world. They hate they love to hate them. Uh, if you like if you like clicky, clicky switches, that's fine. I I liked clicky switches for some time. I grew grew out of it. I'm team linear now. Next up, you got uh, the tactile switches right here. Your typical ones are the Cherry MX Browns. And uh, those ones on the ramps, there's a little tactile bump. Might be hard to see there. But on the ramp where it's... Uh, I wonder if I can zoom up on that. Hold on. On the ramp right here. So this is what it's known. This is what you see as the ramp, right? There's a little bump. Now, what happens there is as you depress it, you gotta you gotta overcome that bump, and you feel it, and it gives you that sensation of like a boop before it goes all the way down and travels down, and now. The point of contact is just after the bump. So after the bump, this this leaf will ride over and make contact with the with the uh, the other part of the leaf to be a key press, essentially. Now linear switches like the Cherry MX Reds, those they just have a straight ramp. So it's pretty much boop boop. As soon as it passes a certain distance in travel the key press is done. You're not going to feel exactly when the key press is, and this is why some people really, really prefer the uh, tactiles, because they know oh, that's where the key press is. And then other people prefer the bump, the clicky ones, because that's an audible, an audible thing for, uh, and, and you feel it. So the clicky ones, they also have the tactile feel to them. Because you go over a kind of a little bit of a tactile bump before that jacket falls down. And that's what gives you the click sound. And then um, one one that's not in here is the speed switches. And basically speed switches is the profile of the ramp is just in a different position. So it's a little bit further engaged already. So typically a Cherry MX red switch is four, four millimeters of travel total. And uh, after that four mils of travel, uh, two mil of the travel is where the switch act activation happens. That's when the, the contacts make contact and they have two more mil of travel before you bottom out. And so when you get speed switches, 
I think it's it's like 1.4 mil or 1.2 mil before this the actuation. The actuation just happens a lot higher on the switch. So I, I'm not a fan because I like to rest my fingers on the keys. So you get a lot of accidental key presses. That's just a thing that happens with, with those ones. A lot of people like those for gaming because it's faster response. Ba -ba -ba. Boom, you got it in there. Um, but yeah, it's all, a, it's all a preference game. If anyone tells you, if you like blues and somebody tells you you can't have blues, tell them to, tell them to get lost. <laughs> I mean, that's just, that's just how it is. I mean, I have clicky switches on my, my keyboard at work and we'll get into that. We'll get into that because I'm going to be changing those for some other switches. I want to go linear with them. Miss inputs are the worst. Miss inputs are the worst. Because typos, I mean, doesn't matter what you're doing. If you're, if you're gaming, miss inputs suck. Um, if you're typing for work, which I do, I do work orders right all the time for because uh, I'm a mechanic and I'm I'm filling out work orders, and I I hate typos. I just I'm OCD about that. I really like to make sure my all my stuff's perfect when I before I hand it in. I cracked the spear and I didn't even take a sip from it. Ooh. Uh, Trash Sniper, by the way, uh, check out the Discord. I, I forgot to put a link in the description. Let me put that in there. Um, yeah, we have a Discord community. It's growing and it's a great community. We'd love to have you. Let me just get the invite. As soon as I have that, oh, where are we? I'll just I'll grab that in a minute. Anyway, I wanted to explain my keyboard. Here I am already in the Discord. We talk all the time when you re on. Oh, what's your? You got a different handle. So that's yeah, that's a thing. So here we go. My keyboard at work. It's a mechanical keyboard. I, I, I don't, I, I use a laptop at work, but I have it up on a shelf and I use this mechan wireless mechanical keyboard. And it just, it feels better to use a mechanical keyboard. I hate typing on laptops. It's just not fun for me. But anyway, this is the one I'm going to be setting up some switches for. So I'm not going to be taking this one apart today. It's still at work. I still have a lot of work to do with the switches before I get to doing that part of it. So I wanted to, I wonder if I still have the link for it. Where do I get my switches? Do, 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 do. Yeah, Sprit Design. Here we go. So Sprit Design is a website that, um, so there's a lot of keyboard websites that uh, you can buy switches and all that from. But this is where I bought my springs. <laughs> I gotta find that particular page. Give me a second here. This is this is it. So what we have here is what they call a slow rate spring. So a, a spring that has a slow rate is different than a standard rate spring. And it's different than a progressive rate spring. So let's get into that. Why, why is that? Now, before I show you the curves, let me just explain what, what that's all about. Now, a progressive spring is, is, is pretty common. You'll hear about this in the automotive world where a spring is uh, its first amount of tension is lighter. And then as you get in more, it progressively gets harder and harder. Now that sounds normal, right? But this is an increased amount of that, if, if you follow me. So uh, normally a spring will get more and more weight before you get to the point where you bottom it, bottom it out. A progressive spring will have more weight than that. So basically, 
some of the coils will collapse on themselves, essentially almost fully collapse before you even get to pressing the last bit of the coil. So if you looked at it on a, if you made it all straight, typically it would be uh, thicker in the middle kind of thing and thinner towards the edges and then it's coiled up. Or it could be tempered differently or something like that, right? That's a progressive spring. A standard spring would just, the, the coils would collapse all together in a uniform fashion, right? Now, a slow spring is a spring that tries to maintain the same amount of pressure throughout its full travel as much as possible. Now, it's it's not going to be, you always, you obviously you get to the point where you're fully compressed and then it boop, spikes up and then you're fully, uh, it, it just goes exponential, right? At that point, once you're fully compressed, you, exponential uh, growth in, in grams of force. But we'll just have a look quickly at the, at the curves here. So a linear spring, as you compress it, see what we're looking at here is, uh, so your X and Y axis here. X axis is how many grams of force. And then Y axis would be um, the, the point of travel, like how, how much you've traveled in until the point where you bottom out. And then the end of the graph is where you've bottomed out. And then they're all virtually the same uh, amount of grams of force. Now, so a linear spring starts off at a lower amount. So they feel pretty light at the top. And then as you press them, it it's a pretty linear form. Boom, just gets uh, heavier. The progressive springs, they stay light, stay light, stay light, then get heavier, right? That's the concept there. Now the slow, slow curved spring starts heavier but then maintains that more. It maintains the, its initial weight more throughout the travel of the actual uh, compression of the spring. So this is what I really wanted in a, in a switch because I didn't like the switches being too light at the top. I wanted it to be, to feel pretty uniform all the way down. So, I went and I ordered a bunch of these ones. And I not only did I order a bunch of them uh, of one size, I ordered a, a few different sizes <laughs> or a few different weights, right? So I believe I ended up settling on the 65 gram springs for my keyboard. My keyboard here. I settled with a 65 gram. Now for work, because I don't, well, I don't have any more of those 65s. I could order more, but for work, uh, in a grittier shop environment, I'm heavier with the typing and everything. So I was, I'm thinking of going with a 72 gram spring, and that's what I'm going to be doing today. I'm going to be taking what I have here. And that's a bunch of Cherry MX Reds that actually came out of this keyboard. And these, I'm going to take them apart and I'm going to be switching the springs out for the 72 gram slow curve springs. And then we're also going to be lubricating them and making sure that they're nice and smooth, glidey. That's the way to go. But hey, why don't I pop this in the Discord into Community Creations, put out an invite for everybody out there. I forgot to tell the world that I'm streaming. Live streaming with Clido. Here we go. Let's get that. Invite out to the world. ATW which has Tristan. Ah okay, that's why I didn't know. My man, how you doing? 
Come hang out. Come hang out. Hold on. On YouTube. Live. What am I doing? I'm... I'm busting out the lube. Winky face. Beautiful. I think the latency is not What's that bad. What did you do? What did you do, Rompus? I think the latency is a little better today than it's been. I put it at low latency, but not the ultra low. Just wanted to make sure I keep uh, decent quality on the streams. You know what My I mean? My kid forcing me to watch Wolf and Cub. Making you watch Wolf and Cub? I don't know what that is. Is that like a new Disney Pixar thing? <laughs> I'm not familiar with that one. My uh, my kids watch more Japanese stuff. The whole Japanese side of the equation. Rompus, I'm, I'm fixing my keyboards today. I was just showing it off earlier. Let me... Just get this out of here. Bo -bo. So this is my keyboard at work. This guy right here. And it's got the old Cherry MX Blues, my man. And I'm I'm just I'm over I'm over the clickiness. And I feel that they, they're not so consistent. And I ah, dude, I absolutely love my keyboard here. I just, I love. Lol, it's an S old Japanese samurai movie. Oh, is nice. it? But, um, yeah. No, I just, I love the feel of these custom keys that I put together. So, I want to, I want to do something good for my keyboard at work. And it was funny, funny, funny that. So, you'll notice the keyboard at work is 100% keyboard. Got an I got a numpad. I use the numpad all the time. I had friends telling me, scrap the numpad. You never, you'll never use it. You won't miss it. You won't miss it. Um, but when I'm editing and stuff, I'm constantly inputting values. So that, that was another thing that I, I had to do when I switched, when I switched to the 10 key list, as they call it, because it's less, less 10 keys. Um, it's more, more than 10 keys. I know, but it's, it's called 10 key list. Switch to this design. I love it because I got space for the mouse now. But now I got the I got the numpad, which I customized as well. I love this thing. I love this thing, and uh, it's nice because I can put it anywhere. I can put it off to the side, and just drag it in as I need it. But gotta have the numpad, dude. Gotta have the numpad. I can't edit without a numpad. It's just. It's not kosher, man. It's not kosher. But yeah, that's that's the keyboard at work that's going to get some special little TLC, a little tender loving care coming up. But hey, why don't we just uh, get right over to the workbench? I mean, I have to probably switch mics here. I'm going to have to get on this guy here and head on over to the work bench, which is actually just right next to where I'm, where I was at before. But hey, check this out. Cool idea, IDNT know what you meant by looking keys lol. <laughs> yeah, the lube and keys thing. So this, this is what came off of the, the HyperX keyboard. This is what I pulled off of that one. This is my special keyboard Crytox 205 G0 
three milligrams Sunny milliliters. Chiba. Sunny and Chiba. My man, this this was yeah, it was quite a mission. And I had some spill out on me. So we're just gonna clean up that mess here real quick. Cause uh I don't like to have a mess. So yeah, this is where I keep all my keyboard stuff. Oh no, 65 slows. Yeah, no, these are the... Okay, these are the... No. 68s is what I went with. 68s, my bad. 68s is what I put into the... The uh, HyperX. In Wolf and oh. Oh, okay. But that's a nice keyboard. Yeah, man. I love my keebs. My keebs. So these are the these are the uh, standard um, springs that came out of the switches that I had. I got those Gateron switches from Drop, and Drop is great. I've uh, got nothing but good things to say about Drop. I kind of want to try out their keyboards. The Alt is it the Alt with the bezel? is a nice looking keyboard tell me if you guys want me to show you what i'm talking about because uh i think you'd like it but my uh the keyboard that i really want to get is the uh uh the tofu tofu series keyboards from kbd fans got some extra keys in here I got 72, there we go. I'm gonna put these 68, they're not actually 68s, but I'll put that bag back. Get out of here, get out of here. So, I even busted out the second webcam for you guys. You see what I'm doing here? I, I'm doing it, I'm doing this for you guys. Busting out the other key, the other cams. I even have the close up cam, if you wanna see this. So what I got going on here is these are the Cherry MX Reds that I desoldered from the HyperX keyboard. These are the ones that are getting the special treatment today. And if I have time, I might get these a little bit of special treatment. Now these are knockoff Cherry Reds that came in the numpad that I had. Because I used the same rebuilt... Um, Franken switches that I used on the on the HyperX on my numpad and I love it I love it um, but yeah these these were like the knockoff cherries that came on that thing so those can go whoop whoop back in this bag we'll put them off to the side and we'll deal with those if we have time now the keyboard at work I don't know if it's going to get all the keys, or all the switches switched out. Might actually um, leave some of them as uh, cherry blues because, I mean, what are you going to do, right? What are you going to do? You can't. If I don't have enough, I'm not going to waste my time on it. Now, I forgot my tool in here. Is it in, did I leave it in here? Yes. Yes, I did. And my little brush. I'll show you the method here. What we do. Whoa, hey. Spring. Mystery spring. Sup, Clyde. What is happening? What is happening? Who am I? Who am I? What's up in? Jelly Duck. My man. My man. We are doing some keyboard switches today you tuned in for the most thrilling the most riveting <laughs> commentary over a keyboard you've ever experienced so main goal here is to get all these guys broken down now if you see you can see what's going on here I'll show you in a way that maybe is a little more visible 
Now, this little guy here is a switch opener. Now, there are two main kinds of switches. There's the Gateron switches, and I forget what the name of this. The tinkle Bell Board. Yeah, that's right, the Tinker Tinkle Bell Board. That's right, my man. So, um, I think they're uh, the the Kale box switches. Anyway, this little guy, handy dandy little piece of work. Cracks open. It's got two different kinds of switch openers. And what's going on here no. is on the switch you've got these little tabs, you know, these little tangs, right? And that's what holds the switch together. And uh do do do. Yes. This this guy's got four little bits that engages those tangs. And as you push it down, it opens the tangs and then you can pop the switch open. And then you can see all the little different bits and bobs that are involved here, right? If I'm not getting my hand in the way. So the stem sits in the in the spring there. Oh, nice. And that's where it pushes down on the leaf to engage the actual contact inside. And this is where we can take it all apart. Boop, boop. And line them all up. And that's what we're going to be doing here. Just this but a lot more times and just chill and have a sip and enjoy enjoy the sometimes it's, it, these tasks I mean like it's funny there's a lot of people that they're looking for excitement in their spare time right but sometimes Sometimes doing things like this is just what the doctor ordered. You know what I mean? Sometimes you don't need all that excitement. Sometimes you just need a little bit of a, a task to do. Just complete it. Slowly. Take your time. One switch at a time. Well, it's going to be... Was it like about 30 at a time? It's a lot. It's a lot of switches. But we're gonna get to get to the next part once we get all this done here. And I'm just making sure that some of these tabs they get they get bent out of shape. So I just want to make sure that they're still in good shape, still in good order. So I can. Are you pulling out those pieces? Yeah, I'm pulling them all out. So what I'm doing, Jelly, is uh, I'm taking these switches apart, and I'm going to take the springs out, and I'm going to change the springs for these guys. And I was explaining earlier that these are a slow rate spring and it has 72 grams of force. So it's a lot heavier. Considerably heavier. Sorry, I had a belch there. Man, the the beer. Them drills. The beer's doing it. Them drills. I had to look to see if one of my drills was like in the way. <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean, them drills? But, yeah, I'm gonna... Keep popping these open. Get these out there. Just taking my sweet, chilling time with it. Whoa, don't fall. Don't fall in. My man. And then, yeah, the other part is the lubrication process. So, uh, lubricating all the switches. So, there's some cool little projects that I want to get into 
on this channel and just hanging out and doing some things. Um, Keebs is one. I mean, Keebs. I mean, those things when you put machine. I mean, those things when you put the drilling machine. Drills. Drills. Do we have any? Are they, is there any drills visible right now? I'm looking around to see if I see any drills. I'm not seeing any. You had you you got me off guard because under the table there's actually a drill. It's just sitting here under the table. <laughs> like, how could you possibly see that? It's not in any camera's view. So the other trick to pulling these things apart is not breaking them as you push them apart. Like, I'm always afraid of breaking the tabs off or or bending them beyond the point of where they would be, you know, they would comfortably go back into place. You know what I mean? Because they are. This one when I am talking about while you reholding lol. <laughs> what? Yeah, right? So, oh, where was I? Yeah, yeah, the, the little tabs. Because if you push too hard or you, you're a little too too tough on them, too hard on them, you can bend, bend them too far out of shape. And then, oof, right? Those big oofs. Do you want to just make sure... You push them down, get a decent little separation, and then pick them apart. Ooh, separate them. And then just move on down the line. Move on down the line. I wonder if I need to get autofocus going on this webcam. Because uh, normally I don't do macro stuff. So webcams you just put into the infinite focal range, right? But this this kind of is diving into macro territory. So here's the weird thing about this stand. You don't necessarily want to grab, put these down this way. Because they have like a little X carved out for the switch, the stems to go in. But that's not a good way to have these, so I just put them upright this way. I think we'll just do one row at a time. Not in like production mode, I'm just in chill out and work on keebs mode, you know? Just happy to have a chill, a little bit of chill time. But yeah, let's open up. I'm gonna open up my. You skipped one, then went back re. Ah, you noticed. <laughs> That's great. Oh my god. I'm just gonna. I'm gonna get the autofocus going on this one webcam. If it'll allow me to do that. C922. Let's go. Let's go autofocus. Oh, look at that. That looks a little better. It's gonna it's gonna get all racky and all over the place, back and forth and all that stuff. But we'll see. I'm just gonna minimize that and keep that up. Also wanna have stream open. Nice. Nice, nice. I'm glad you guys came out. Autofocus, that's crazy. Hey, man, you ever tried? EF Jamie pulled that shit up. <laughs> Dude, the technology is just off the chains these days. Autofocus and shit. Man. I don't know if I can handle this. Bob Lazar was right. It's alien. We've been reverse engineering this stuff. <laughs> So I'm taking these 
these uh these little springs out. Hey, oh, autofocus, do your thing. Webcams love macro stuff, right? Webcams are funny because macro is like their range. You get into this territory, you get outside of this far, and webcams are just garbage. And that's what I was getting into earlier is um, some of the projects that I'm going to be working on. So one of the projects I want to work on is um, these, this. Uh, it's really cool. It's um, why don't I just show you guys? I get on this uh, mic here. Let me just show you. Pull it up. I love this uh, thing. I hope I have it in, I got too many things in my bookmarks. Oh, I'm going to have to search it because, oh boy. I've, oh, there it is. Boom. Hello. This. So Kuro Kesu is a website from Europe somewhere. And what they make is uh, enclosures for webcams. Specifically, Logitech webcams. But what's really cool about these enclosures is uh, they make it so you can actually put a CCTV lens on them. So you can put like proper optics on a webcam and it and it, it makes it so you can get a much better picture out of it. So this is something that I really wanted to do. Uh, so this this one in particular is the Brio kit. And then oh, I got this fancy cord. It's a USB-C type cord, but with the with the thumb screws. <laughs> That's interesting. That's like an old monitor. Um, but that's handy. That's like real handy. I think um, da -da -da -da. also on the website C920. So he, this one, this one is really cool because the C920 is a cheap, cheap webcam. The Brio is expensive, and if I could, if I was to do it all over again, I wouldn't have bought it. I have a Brio. Mm, it's okay. It's okay, but it's not. It's not like over two hundred dollars. Okay, you know what I mean. These things go for for peanuts. The C920s, and then you can get this little kit that's an enclosure that makes it so you can put real optics on it. So I'm really interested in this because uh, today I'm using two C920s um, to look at what it is that we're doing. So it would be nice to see how well this performs over the regular standard because I mean, it's hardly a lens in the C920, you know what I mean? Or in the Brio or any webcam for that matter. It's hardly a lens, but if you put proper glass behind it, you get a much nicer image. Much nicer image. So, yeah, that's uh, that's kind of the plan. That's something I'd like to do, um, but we'll see. Work work on that as, uh, as the time goes on. But hey, let's get back to this. More keep switches. But yeah, are you, are you digging the digging the the cams, the two camera angles? You can see both at the same time. It's pretty cool. I thought it was neat. Anyway, moving on, we've got the 72 gram slow curve springs from Sprit Designs. This video is not sponsored. This is, yeah. Woohoo. I almost need another little tray. That would be fantastic. To put more switches. Ah, more, sorry, the springs in the tray somewhere. Ah, we'll get around to it. 
So the springs is not this step just yet, because what we want to do is start doing the, the lubricity. About to get a little British up in here. Now, when it comes to lubricant, less is more. I'm sure you've heard that before, but it is very true. Less is more. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do all the bases first because that just works. But what I'll do is I'll show you one and show you how I go through all the steps on doing one. And then Sounding I'll... like Megan Friedman laws. <laughs> Sounded like, nice. <laughs> like Morgan Freeman. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'll, I'll go through all the steps on one and then we'll we'll just go through all of them and do it. Ava, Ava Nova, what's happening? It's been a minute. Good to see ya. Good to see ya. I'm doing some keyboard switches today. We're lubricating. So, this is my Crytox lube. So what I do is I'll, I'll just get a little bit on the brush, like not a ton, just a little bit. And that might even be a, a little much, right? Now, what I like to do is get this little guy to grab the stem. Oop, there we go. Grab the stem with this little guy, a little stem grabber. And then oh, give it a little swipe on the contacts where it, where it actually rides down. Just a little bit on both sides. And you'll notice your first few swipes or a little bit more you, you'll you'll see a little white residue left behind you just basically want to come back and wipe it up so you don't see any of the white it's just kind of shiny and a little bit on the face a little bit on the face there people like to you like to do the springs and I just don't really see any point in doing the springs it makes no sense to me why you would do the springs like as if they're the springs make a twangy noise or something along those I know I mean I work in automotive I work on cars we don't lubricate springs <laughs> this is not something we do now you might put a little bit of lube where the spring sits in the base that's fine because the spring will actually like be rubbing up against the base where it makes contact with the other material, in this case plastic, against metal. In cars, there's actually um, a rubber bushing between the spring and the metal chassis. So that's what makes up for that. So yeah, you can you can you can just touch the base with a little bit of lube. There's no point in my opinion. I mean, you hear it all the time. Uh, yeah, you hear it all the time to take the brush and put it in the hole and, and swirl it around. Come on, focus. Anyway, you see it. So that, that little hole, no need for that. Just a little bit of lube up these, these channels on the sides, because that's where the actual stem rides in, and that's what's important. Get that lubricated and and then that's that's it that's all you need uh, you can put a little bit of lube on the um, the ramps but I'd say be sparing with that like be very sparing because that's where the actual leaf comes in contact with the stem and the leaf is what makes the electrical connection. So if you you just don't want to add anything that may compromise the electrical connection there. I doubt it would, but I'm just throwing that one out there. Now, yeah, some people some <laughs> I see it in videos all the time where they they'll take the uh the springs and then they'll put them all in a bag and then they'll shake and bake them essentially <laughs> with lubricant and that's completely pointless. There's there's absolutely no benefit to that at all. But 
we can uh, we can all pretend that there is. So we'll put these back together. Boom, boom. Now that's that. You've got the stem and you've got the base together with the new spring. And from there, you can take your cap. Make sure that the orientation is correct. So the, the bold side goes on the side with the leaf. Drop this down. Make sure that the ramp is facing the leaf. Make sure that your hand is not in the way for the people to see. And you pop it together. Now, if you've got a nice tight fit and finish here, then that's good. You're good. You're solid. Bob's your auntie. Time to move on to the next one, right? Now, some of these switches can be kind of janky or, or cheap, cheaply made. And for that, we actually have things that they call, they, these, these you call films, right? Inside this package here, we've got basically these little stickers. And that's probably so hard to see. The white balance is going nut bar on this. But basically what you have is, is a little square shape, right? Now what you can do is you can peel out these little stickers and you can put them in between the two halves and sandwich that together and it'll make it a little bit tighter if it's a loose fit. But none of these are a loose fit, so I'm not going to put any any films in there. We are golden for that. We're good. Right as rain. No problem actually more difficult putting the film paper back in this Ziploc baggie. Got it. Got it. We're good. I'm going to get that under there because it messes with the white balance. Boom. Nice. By the way, if you have any questions, just shoot, ask in the chat. And they don't have to be related to what it is I'm doing right now. If you uh, got any questions, just fire away. That being said, I'm gonna move on, and we're gonna uh, we're gonna do this. My OCD is gonna get the best of me because there's an empty slot at the end. So I'm going to. Put one in where that one we just finished was. Boom. There we go. So now we got a row. We got a row of these things. And, I mean, we can... You can go and do them any which way you want. It's basically just a production line at this point. Get your lube. Get your lube. And like I said, just very little. Like, nothing almost. You just, oh, it's even too much, whoa. Getting heavy, my man, too much. Don't wanna have too much lube. You got, you're going crazy. Hey, you're going crazy with the lube, stop it. Take, take it back. Now, you, the, the, the good thing, if, if you do use too much lube, you can just lube the next switch and then come back with a dry brush and remove some tinkle of the, the tinkle board bro that's right did i spell it wrong cuz you keep keep calling it tinkle board <laughs> noob what's happening brother how you doing so today we're lubing switches getting into the keyboard hobby here on I do something. What do you guys think of the name, by the way? I I was drawing a blank there for a little bit on what I should call the channel. It was formerly Clyde Soapbox, and uh, I kind of grew over that. I got over that name for channel, and then it was Clyde for a while. And it turns out that there's another channel. There's another channel called Clyde. 
Oh, that's like way too much. There's another channel called Clyde, and that guy has 175,000 subscribers. So yeah, just the um, confusion between the two channels alone was enough to not want to have the same name. So I changed it to Clyde Do Something, thinking uh, that's kind of a fun uh, takeaway from Maximum Underdrive from when we were doing that, because that was one of the memes, right? I thought that was pretty fun. Yeah, it's funny. Some people, they get into train sets. <laughs> I get into keyboards. It's uh, it's such a chill thing to do, man. Like, it, I can't emphasize anymore. Like, I've never had a hobby that was like this. Kind of just chill back and, and do stuff. Everything else has been pretty hype. Or heavy lifting and stuff like that. kind of a, a fun little hobby. It can be expensive though, not gonna lie. Can really get up there in price for, um, yeah, just, just the, the fact of uh, how, how much all the components will cost you. It's like you can g you can get bits and bobs for cheap, but like all the bits and bobs put together, once you've added it all up, holy cow! It's easy to it's easy to spend like three four hundred dollars on a keyboard. Like this, <laughs> most people would just tell you that that's just ridiculous, right? But I mean, e well, almost all all the hobbies these days are like that get into anything. Jeez, my parents were asking me if I was going to put the kids into sports. I'm like, well... So, like, hockey, hockey for one, like, bankrupts parents. <laughs> and... Bob S and Bits are where all my money goes, lol. Bits and Bobs, it's where all your money goes, yeah. But yeah, the this, this sports thing, ugh. I mean, I've never been a sports guy. I've tried to get into it. Couldn't. I, like, I really gave it a go. It's like, I had brothers that were into sports. And I was like, I want to be able to have something in common with them and relate. And it just, ugh, it just does not interest me. But the the doing of sports that that's another thing. Um, but at the same time, it, it, they've made it so expensive anymore. <laughs> and as as a grown adult that just wants to have fun doing it, so I I have a friend who's uh, he's a goalie in hockey. He's got all the equipment. He's he's all that stuff. He's really he's pretty good at it. Um, but just to play, to get ice time, like the men's, whatever, uh, amateur hockey drop in or whatever, is like, I think the games start like ice time is like eight, eleven o'clock, <laughs> on and they're on weekdays, and like. To do that, I mean, you're you're not getting home till four, till like two in the morning on a hockey night. Oof, it's brutal. I mean, of course, with the coof, nobody's doing anything. That's a big, big old oof. I guess it depends on where you are, but I don't think they have drop-in hockey. 
even if you got a mask or whatever the whatever the thing de jour is. I'm kind of concerned that I put too much in that one. Maybe I'll just take the remainder from this one, do this, and then come back with a dry brush. Hit that up. Yeah, there's all kinds of hobbies that I've always wanted to get into and just never really had time. And I think um, now's the time for me to start getting into some of them. I really want to try tinkering with uh, like Raspberry Pi and Arduino stuff. Whoop. Lost that guy. Yeah, Arduino sounds really cool. One thing I've always wanted to try to do, this would be a cool concept, right? Is to, um, I wanted to get a webcam for the room. That, that was one, one that I wanted to do for just a wide angle. But I thought it'd be cool to have another webcam that had a joystick control and a motorized thing so you could pan around and look at where you want it to look. And then I thought it would be cool if I incorporated that with some sort of web API <laughs> so the chat can control it. Does that make sense? Either, either by going to a website to control it but it or by using numbers or whatever in the chat but i i thought that would be a cool concept try to tinker around and, and make something like that so here we go it's it's pretty fun what you can do with um some basic programming basic circuitry basic like basic electronics and um, some web API like web web programs uh, like if this then that if this then that's pretty cool like once once you dive into it it's there's levels of complication that you can get into, but some of the basic stuff is pretty simple. And, you know, it's not long before you get into a real deep dive and you're like, I wanna, oh, I can do that? Well, what if I could do this? What if I could do that? Oh, that's cool. What if I took that and incorporated it with this other thing and do this other thing and that'd be cool. I like the idea of giving other people control of things. That's what a lot of the stuff in uh, Maximum Underdrive was about. It was fun uh, letting the chat switch scenes in OBS and stuff. It was funny. As long as there's limitations to that, <laughs> it can go overboard. People can go nuts with it. Okay, let's get some of these stems. Liking it. Definitely liking the chill music vibes. You know what reminds me of this music is uh, my man Number One Gun. I haven't tuned into one of his streams in a little bit. I noticed he's on YouTube as well. And that makes me smile. Because I am I'm, I'm pretty much done with Twitch. I think that website is trash. 
in like a few different meanings of the word. Trashy. It's pretty trashy. Um, it's nice being on a website where you can tell your friends that have kids, hey, check me out. And then they don't have to come back to you and say, dude, why did you send me to a prawn site? And then you have to explain, that's not a prawn, it's... Good music, but this guy keeps talking over it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know it. Oh, that's just beautiful. Love it. Love that. Yes. Yes. Yeah, I'm going to have to check out Number One Gun's streams again. Now that he's on. Well, I think, I think he restreams. I think he's on both. He's on YouTube and Twitch. I just decided to end my Twitch endeavors. Um, I, just don't, I just don't like the way that the platform's going. On, on a few different levels. I can't really get behind the morality there. Oof. It's not... I, I don't... Let's just say I don't share their sentiment. YouTube seems to be stepping up their game in the live um, arena. And it's not that YouTube didn't have good live streaming before. It's just... Um, I don't think they were really a, a competitor with Twitch. Twitch being the service that is specifically live streaming. But it seems that they they've hired a CEO for YouTube gaming, and he's uh, been taking his job pretty seriously. I like the sound of that. But I do like. Live streaming that's not just gaming as well though. So And my first live streaming experience wasn't actually gaming at all. So it was it was more commentary and and that turned into news and politics and <laughs> uh, Yeah. That's um that's a can of worms you just don't want to open, I, I'm afraid. Oh boy, these are just beautiful. Love it. That keyboard is going to love me for it. It's going to be so happy, it's going to be like Clyde. Thanks for the switches. Thanks for those beautiful <laughs> buttery lubed up switches. They're just fantastic. My man. You really know how to treat your keyboards. Feels good, man. It's funny, I, I kept hearing that from the keyboard world. Ah, uh, you never know what... You know, once you go lubed, you can't go back. 
right? And I thought, well, I gotta, I gotta try it. I gotta try it. I don't wanna hear what all this hype is about. And, uh, yeah, it's true. It's absolutely true. Once you've had lubed switches, it's kinda... Everything kinda just feels scratchy after. Like, you touch a keyboard and they the keys are just like you feel all of like the uh, the uh, yeah it just emphasizes it once you know and especially when you go through the process as well it just becomes that much more intimate right Taking your time with every single one. A lube keyboard. Yeah, lubed. Lubed switches on your keyboard. <laughs> you know, it's funny though. It makes me laugh. Is like, so I mean, this this is fun. You're hanging out with me while I'm doing this, right? And and that's cool. But there there are like multiple multiple channels on YouTube that have popped up around the keyboard genre, and it I find it really funny the way YouTube is right because YouTube YouTube is is made up of niches, these really interesting niches, and people will make a channel and they'll have a they'll have a video pop right. It'll, it'll get some attention and then next thing you know that channel that's all they do you know like comment there's somebody comments about comic books and that video pops now they're a comic book channel they don't do anything else and <laughs> i think that's what happened with keebs so people, uh, people got into people did a keyboard video and then you know that video pops. Oh, I guess that's what, that's my calling. <laughs> I do keyboard videos. And I'm not slamming on the because I love some of these channels, man. That Glarses, that guy. Oh, my God. It's funny. I just like to see him do other stuff, too, right? That's all I'm saying. It's like, you, you, you learn to like some of these personalities, people that do things. And you're like, all right, well, I'm into keyboards, too. That's cool. But like, what else do you do? <laughs> you know? But YouTube, the the sort of, uh, the way she goes is the algorithm will pick you up for that one thing and then it'll only ever recommend you for that one thing. Maybe you could switch gears. I don't know how it's, I don't know how it's done. So, for example, my channel this channel. I've done videos in the past about tools and those tool videos still get hits today. Like consistently, a lot. And uh, so YouTube recommends me my videos to people that watched those videos or other people that watch vid similar videos to about tools. So they'll get recommended my channel. But not all my videos are about tools. So some people, I think, when they get recommended my other videos, they're like, why is this in my feed? Why? YouTube, what are you doing recommending me this? And, well, that, that's it. They think that YouTube's algorithm, it, I mean, does what it does, but it, it, it can't be that smart. So it just, it picks like a, a thing, a genre or a, a niche, and it just essentially assigns that to you if you had a video pop. Of course, that's my theory. I could be totally wrong, but 
I don't know if I've heard a better explanation for it. May have given that one a little bit more grease than necessary. <laughs> we'll see. Just got a lot on the brush at the moment. I tried, I tried lapping it up. My God, is it nice to have just a chill moment after today? I mean, I, I didn't have a, the greatest of days. I, I I don't have a lot to complain about. I got, things are pretty good for me. But I didn't have the best day. So it's nice to have some chill time. I'm just hoping uh, things smooth out. I just I had a, a few jobs at work that were um, not smooth, didn't go smoothly. Now, uh, a big thing I want to do on this channel is um, commentary about my trade and what it is that I do. So. A lot of a lot of channels pop up about how to do stuff and all that yada yada. You don't you don't see a lot that are channels that talk about um, just the real ins and outs of uh, the auto trade. You know you have Eric the car guy. He's he's a good guy. He's a good guy, but I think he's a bit removed. And he was, um, he was a dealership guy. And I'm not, I'm not slagging people that like to work as a dealer, but that's only one aspect of the trade, right? And I think he only worked at that one dealer before going off and doing his own thing. And he was, uh, yeah, correct me if I'm wrong, but yeah, he worked at a Honda dealer, and. And then he uh, worked out of his garage on people's cars for a while doing YouTube videos. And then his YouTube thing took off and he's just been his own little shop. And a mix between working on people's cars, making videos about that, and his own little hot rod project or whatever. That's That was the last I, I saw of him. I haven't really watched him since. He's doing a, a fair lane, a Ford fair lane. Sometimes he talks about like the ins and outs of the trade. Um, but yeah, I don't know if he has much more experience in that aspect of it. And he's a good mechanic, you know. I'm not slagging him or anything. Just I've been around the block. <laughs> I've been around the block. I've done the dealer thing. I worked at the dealership. I worked at indie shops. I worked at several indie shops. I've worked in other trades. Worked in the mining sector. I worked as essentially a millwright. Without credentials, unfortunately, because that company wouldn't sign for them. So I could go get them. That was unfortunate. Hey, look at these. Look at that. Beautiful. But yeah, I want to I want to do some commentary videos about some quirky little ins and outs of uh, automotive and the the trade. Yeah, but then uh, other commentary stuff. I want to mix it up because uh, I'm not just into one niche right like i was saying about the youtubers thing which i find just hilarious the, the one niche pony channels i mean it's essentially how it works but yeah i kind of want to just 
because I've been doing this content creation thing for a long time. I kind of just want to play it by my own rules anymore. You know, I, uh, I think I've done the dance enough where I'm trying, I was chasing, chasing the thing, trying to find the thing that people are interested in. What are they going to watch me do? And if, if nobody watches me, that's fine. If, and if lots of people watch me, well, that's cool too. I'm just kind of in it for my own entertainment value at this point. And to do, do the things that I like to do. Like customizing Gabe's. And just having a chill, chill evening on a Friday night. Damn, Friday night. wonder what happens on a Friday night anymore in this new world. The new world of masks and... And vax and... Passports and all that. For the young, young crowd. I used to go to the bar all the time. That was my thing when I was a kid. When I was a kid. I mean, <laughs> when I was a young adult. <laughs> I used to go to the bars. Hang out. Play pool. Drink beers. Can you even do that stuff anymore? I don't know. The pub, the pub that I did like going to in my town shut down and they're not reopening. That's just, that's it. That's the end of it. And it's really sad because they made the best chicken wings, like the best, best chicken wings in this town. I don't know if they're the best chicken wings I've ever had, but they're the best chicken wings in this town, <laughs> you know? And to see that go away is sad. Very sad. And they used to have, um, they had half price appetizers on Thursdays. And of course, wings are appetizers. So the place would just pack out for these, these buffalo wings. So good. They were, what they call double crunch which I just recently learned the recipe from for from uh, a friend of mine which I, I didn't know previously so to get double crunch wings apparently what they would do was the day before so a whole day before this there's some prep involved right they take flour, take flour, salt, pepper, onion powder, and garlic powder. Put that all in a big, big old bowl. And then from there, they would, whoops. From there, they would basically powder these wings put them in the in the bowl powder them all up and then put them on a baking pan I guess and then just leave them in the fridge or whatever for the whole day and then just let them sit with that powder on them and then when it came time to somebody who ordered them they would get another batch of that powder and they would do it again before frying it so that that's the double crunch so double double powdered before it goes into the fryer but man were they good <laughs> they were really good oh man and then when they come out of the fryer then that's when you uh put whatever sauce on them and i used to get the buffalo all the time because i loved that smoky barbecue flavor with the hot sauce. 
Yum. I'm getting hungry thinking about this. Just thinking about the double crunch wings. Man, am I getting hungry. Ooh, back to her. Oh, not quite yet. Not quite yet. I gotta separate the stems. These guys over here. Fun, fun. Keyboard switches there. Yeah, there's that. Boom, boom. But yeah, getting back to it. So I want to talk about some of the ins and outs of the trade. So I'm working on working on a concept for a video, just talking about etiquette. And <laughs> so talking about etiquette, but okay, so I'm sure there's a lot of people who have talked about etiquette, the etiquette of being a mechanic, or the etiquette of the shop dynamic, but what I'm thinking about is the etiquette of a customer coming to an auto garage. This is one you don't hear about a lot, but you hear about as a mechanic, and everybody's got their opinion on it. And there's there's some things that people I don't I don't know if they just don't know better, but man, they ought to. <laughs> A big peeve of mine is people come um, come in with messy cars. Like I cannot stand a dirty car. Like I get it if your car's dirty and you just you haven't got around to it, that's fine. Don't bring it to a mechanic like that. What are you doing? You know what I mean? Like I had my little commuter car for a while. I had it for years. And yeah, I just leave wrappers and stuff and all that stuff. But if I ever had to take it somewhere, or if I ever knew I was going to have a passenger, I'd clean the thing out. You know? I would clean it out, and I would make sure that it wasn't a sty. Because, holy... <laughs> you serious? Some of these people's cars, man. One of the technicians I was working with today, he pulled a car in. And there was cherry tomatoes between the seats. There was like cherry tomatoes between the seat and the center console, right by this where you put your hand to put you grab your seatbelt. Like, <laughs> what? I got in a car a few weeks back. And there was a banana under the under the the brake pedal. Uh, not, a, not sorry, not a banana, like a banana peel, not not a fresh banana, one that's been eaten and then discarded <laughs> in the floor, of the front driver's seat. Like what? Are you? <sighs> God, like I just I'm not I'm not sure what's going on in these people's heads, because like for me taking a messy car to a mechanic is like having dirty skivvies going to the doctor, right? Like you're gonna go to the, you, you can go for a physical, and you soiled yourself. You know what I mean? Like, what are you, what are you doing? And these people in their messy cars, and my favorite, my absolute favorite, is the, the front line, I the bumper sticker. I support frontline workers. I support the frontline workers. 
and then they've got masks all over the car and their drink cups where their slobbery lips have been on in the cup holder right next to the shifter. You support frontline workers. <laughs> Get out of my face. <laughs> what? You kidding me? Yeah. Reality check. Mechanics are frontline workers. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. Yeah, people. People with their... I just, call, I just keep calling them dirty skivvies. If I see a car that's just nasty, I just... That person is now dirty skivvies to me. <laughs> I just can't think of it any other way. <laughs> what I get here? <laughs> Thomas! Thomas! What is happening, my man? Thank you. Thank you for the super chat. What did you say here? Dirty, smelly, the worst. Here's ten dollars for an air freshener. <laughs> yeah, that's right, my man. How you been, Thomas? I haven't talked to you in a hot minute. But yeah, dude. Okay, so yeah, I want to talk about the etiquette. Etiquette of being a customer for a mechanic, and maybe there's people that are unaware of this, but like there are some <laughs> dumb long things. Time no CHST. It has been, man. It's been too long. It's been too long. But, and uh, I mean, uh, so Thomas is a mechanic as well. And. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm talking about, man. Okay, so another thing. So yeah, you got the dirty cars, and that that's just terrible. And people are horrible for that, and I I'll never forgive them. <laughs> anyway, uh, then there's then there's uh, the people people that insist on buying their own parts, and they've got a bunch of different reasons for it, right? And they all kind of make sense, like, from their perspective. But it only makes sense from their perspective if they don't consider <laughs> the shop's perspective. Right? And that's exactly what they're not doing, is, is taking into consideration a business and how a business operates. Right? So, the, the rule of thumb here is that when people are doing this, they're trying to save a buck. Right? And I get it trying to save a buck cool good on you oh you do a little more leg work just to get that stretch that penny at the end of the day you're not saving yourself anything and here's why all you're doing is creating a headache for everybody involved you um you're not saving you're not saving yourself any money so the way the way it works when an auto garage buys parts from a parts supplier is they get preferential pricing right so the auto shop because because we're dealing with hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of parts every single year we get preferential treatment we get preferred rates we get cheaper pricing right you think that when you go down to the shop and you talk to the guy Oh, I know a guy who's got an account at the shop. And he'll give me a better price. Yeah. Maybe. Maybe better than a list price. Right? Maybe better than a list price. Maybe even better than our markup as a shop. Because here's the thing. We don't just make our money on the labor. Because we have to pay the mechanics. Yeah. But we have to also pay the service writers. The guy, You know the guy that sits on the phone with you while you tell your life story? about how your your dog's not feeling good and how you gotta go out of town to see your granny. Yeah, that guy. He gets a paycheck every single week. And we gotta pay for that. We usually pay for that on the markup that we put on the parts after we've gotten a preferential price because we spend hundreds of thousands of dollars on these parts every year. Right? And we get a slight markup, and that pays for the service writer. Now, the markup, at the end of the day, is probably what you're paying anyway. Right? And then here's the deal. 
we won't give warranty on parts that a customer purchases. And people will think that that's just being spiteful. It's not. It's, it's a clerical thing. So if, uh, if a customer comes in and they've made a purchase on a thing, it's not in our system. That purchase is not in our system. So if there's ever an issue with that part, it's the customer that has the receipt for it, the, all of that stuff. The transaction took place before we were ever involved. So we can't be involved after the fact, right? So you buy your own parts and something goes wrong with it. Well, you're SOL. And if that happens, well, then you're going to end up buying the parts again, probably through the shop because you'll have learned your lesson, right? But that's the thing people do. And then the other thing, this is my favorite of all of them. Customer comes in with their own parts. They were told, you know what? You're going to have to pay a higher labor rate because you came in with your own parts. They go, okay, that's fine. And they say, but you're not going to get a warranty because you came in with your own parts. That's fine. And they agree with that. They agree with all that stuff. So you bring the car in. You put the car up in the hoist. You lift it in the air. You take the wheels off. You start doing the job, whatever parts it is. Say it's brake parts or whatever. Then you go to, you go to put the new parts in. And the guy got you the wrong parts. <laughs> and then what do you do? Do you call the customer and you you have the car on the hoist while you're trying to get a hold of the guy who doesn't want to answer his phone because he's whatever? And you're sitting there and you want to move on to the next job, but you got the car and the wheels already off and you're waiting to do the job and... It's a big old waste of time, is what it is. It's a big old waste of time. And it happens more often than you believe. Or than you, you may think. But... <laughs> this is why... Uh, this is why, as an etiquette thing, just... You may think you're saving a buck. Don't try to buy your own parts. In, in in all honesty, would you would you go to a restaurant, right? And you sit down. You sit down at the table. And you're like, hey, nice restaurant, right? Nice thing. You got the guy, he comes up, he serves you. He's got the white tablecloth over his, over his uh, arm with the wine and all that stuff. Real fancy place. And, uh, he says, okay, so I gave you the menu. Have you decided on your order? And you say, yeah, I'd like to have the steak, but I brought my own meat. Could you just bring this to the sh chef in the back and have him cook it up like it is on the menu? Would you do that? Would you do that? Why do you bring your own parts? Why do you bring your own parts? Yeah, I mean, these, these are the things that we ask ourselves every day. When we see these people in the shop. My god. It's too funny. It's too funny because, I mean, yeah, you, you tell them, but then the next guy just comes in. And then you just get tired of telling people. I think I might, I think I might make a video talking about that. The etiquette of coming to a shop. Hey, Thomas, if you're still in the chat, are you still at the same shop? How are things going for you, man? Still still cool with working on Volkswagens. <laughs> uh, you know, I'll always bug you about that. Etiquette. 
etiquette, the etiquette of being a customer. New shop two years. New shop for two years. How you liking it? Still Euro stuff. Ah, okay. Yeah, I wouldn't expect you to go away from that. Once, once you, once you get yourself into a groove, there's no sense of getting out of it. I've, uh, I found myself doing big, big trucks. <laughs> <laughs> That's, that seems to be my career. And it's it's not because I want to do big trucks, just because I'm in this circumstance where I always end up with big trucks. So, I mean, it is a thing. I don't hate it. It's not, not always my, been my favorite, but... It is good work. It is good work. I'm looking forward to when we see more electric stuff on the Are road. Are you snowed in already up there? No, we're not. We just, we got a ton of rain. My god. Did we get a ton of rain. It is, uh... They were calling like 75 millimeters of rain f over uh, a few days. And we did we ever get rained on? Holy cow! So one of the, one of the developments as of recent is uh, oh by the way, Thomas, I'm 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 lubing uh, switches for a keyboard. If uh, if you're curious, if you came in, if I wasn't explaining that when you were when you came in, um, but one of the, one of the recent developments for me is I scrapped my. My commuter car. I'm only three kilometers away from the shop that I work at. And uh, I got rid of my my little commuter Echo. I had a Toyota Echo for a lot of years that I bought for like $100 off a customer that was going to ditch it. I drove it for about five or six years or so. And then... Uh, And I scrapped it for an electric bicycle. I actually have an electric bicycle. Look at me being all Mr. Environment. But I love it. And even on the rainy days. And boy was it rainy this morning. My neighbor's house collapsed due to the storms. A tree fell on a car with people in it. I live in Oklahoma. Whoa. That is insane. What? There was some big storms in Oklahoma? I wasn't even aware of that. Yeah, we're, we're just getting lots of rain. But that, I mean, that's kind of expected for, uh, for the West Coast in Canada. <laughs> is it North, Northwest, North America, anyway. Yeah, Tuesday there was. That's insane. I'm curious about Whistler, though. Cause now that, Thomas, you mentioned the, the big drop of snow. Or, wondering if we were buried in snow yet. I wonder if Whistler got nailed. Because that, that would be good for them for... Uh, business-wise, assuming people are allowed to go to Whistler, the whole uh, big cough cough, <laughs> I don't know if you're allowed to say the word, I just don't want to say it. It's been ages since I've been snowboarding though been like way too long I've been romanticizing about it but every time I do I think of the 
two hundred dollars a day cost to just go for a single day and, and then I quickly lose interest <laughs> two hundred bucks for a day oof no thanks I just got done with coming home from the hospital. I had a tumor removal last week. It was two inches deep into my back and six inches long and five. Oh, wow. Sorry to hear that. I hope you're all right. I hope everything's good. Surgeries are scary business. Yeah, I wanna. I've been wanting to go snowboarding for a while. I haven't. I am cancer free and in remission. Oh well, thank God for that. Congrats, that's amazing. Yeah, I've been thinking about finding some sort of exercise for me to get back into. So I used to do a crap ton of cardio all the time, and. Used to be snowboarding in the winter and skateboarding in the summer, and I would do it nonstop. And it was just like, it just, it was routine for me. And yeah, it kept me, it kept me thin, and it kept me healthy, even though I had really, really bad habits of lots of drinking and lots of, I used to smoke cigarettes a lot. And, uh, but yeah, all the cardiovascular activity was good, good stuff. But yeah, I've, I've since stopped doing that. And it's amazing how quickly you can get a gut <laughs> when you don't, <laughs> when you're not, when you're not, uh, doing that. So yeah, that was a thing. So I had, I had like my Oprah years, essentially, recently. So like, I fattened up quite a bit, and then I decided that that wasn't good for me. So I, I thinned out. <laughs> when the, when the, when the big coof hit, we were actually concerned about it. And I was drinking a lot of, I was drinking a lot on the regular. So I decided to just like cut it, cut it. And I cut it for about a year completely. And wow, just doing that alone, I lost 20 kilograms of weight. And that was, that's just in, insane. 20 kilograms. That's like a whole sack of rice. It's a lot of weight, just beer weight. And then uh, I was like, wow, I'm getting healthy. This is great. So I had, uh, I had stopped smoking and I took up using the, the vaporizer to, uh, to secede from smoking. Smoking secession tool, I guess they call it. Um, and then I quit that. Which I think is the, the way to go. And I've been healthy boy lately. How's the uh how's the YouTube channel going, Thomas? I was actually thinking about you the other week. Uh, I was thinking about the the old <laughs> that um, 
collab we did for Halloween. Cause I was, I was getting some Halloween stuff going. That was that was a fun one. I had a lot of fun with that. I was 356 pounds in February 2021. I am now 216 pounds. Cancer killed my weight. Not much recording being done. Too busy at the shop. Ah, are are they are they cool with you uh, at the new shop doing the the recording, or is that like a restricted thing? And by the way. Cancer's probably not the best diet, but congrats on all the all the weight loss. <laughs> oh my god, that's a lot of weight. Yeah, because some shops aren't cool with you recording inside their premises. And some are cool with it. I don't know why this one already looks lubed. Did I already lube this one? Weird. That's when you get into the point in this project where you like start losing track of what you're doing. Hold on a second. You gotta recalibrate. Take a step back, bring it back. It's funny, I was looking at, I saw these ads for these different webcam devices that work with your mobile phone. And, um, I don't, rec I don't recall the, the make of it, but there is these, these webcams and they, they connect to your mobile and then you use your mobile phone as like, an editor and then you can stream to whatever streaming service you want and they all work wirelessly and they have like I think like a six hour battery life or whatever if they're not plugged in I want to get back to YouTube again as soon as I am out of pain and able to be comfortable again with doing YouTube yeah yeah, I'd be glad. It'd be great to have you back. YouTube's a funny one. You know, <clears throat> people come, people go, people come back. But YouTube, I don't know. Seems to be a different thing for different people. Be a social hangout thing. Could be a drama thing, which is what tends to happen with the social thing. <laughs> but it's cool after a bunch of years of being on YouTube to see who's still around, who's still doing their thing, who's uh, who's bailed from it entirely. Who's uh, doing what, essentially? I saw I saw Steve Rob's channel recently, and Steve Rob's still at it. Man, that guy just he's he's going strong. He's he's a funny cat. I like that guy. This old man needs to go to bed. Was nice dropping in on you. Good to hear you quit smoking. Take care. Hey, cheers, Thomas. Hey, I'll be uh, I'll be doing more on this channel. So hopefully. No, one of my videos hit 1K in views. I kind of was like, holy moly, that is freaking awesome stuff. To seeing a video still being watched. Lol. Nice, nice. But yeah, uh, we're doing doing a lot. I'll be doing a bit more on this channel, so stay tuned, and uh, I hope to see more 
uploads on yours. If you want to do a collab again, that'd be a lot of fun. That'd be a lot of fun. The last one was a riot. It was a ton of fun. So I'd be up for it. And it's nice to nice that you're in the neighborhood. So to say. So to speak. <laughs> but yeah, have a good night, man. Have a great night. And yeah, you, you made a, a thousand views on a video. Man, that is just that moment, you know, when you I'll keep high and touch. Awesome. Awesome. Cheers, man. It's it's so it's such a cool feeling when you uh when you reach new milestones, you know. I think it's it's a a double-edged sword though. I'll tell you. Cuz um you know, you put a lot of energy into uh growing a channel or whatever. And you can go from being really s excited about view counts to being discouraged or depressed about view counts <laughs> if they don't <laughs> go the way you want. Uh, it kind of ties into what I was talking about before with people uh, going towards particular niches because you'll get a bunch of hits on a video for that particular niche and then you just want to do other things that you're interested in and Tomorrow will be eight months of not smoking cigarettes. My best friend Sarah said I needed to quit smoking cigarettes one day eight months ago. I oh, you just did. You just just quit it like that. Cold turkey that day. Wow. Wow. Good work. I I wasn't. I didn't have that easy a time. Honestly, it was uh, it was rough. It was really rough um, for me. The few times that I tried quitting prior to uh, the, the successful time. So, um, there was a few times I was living in Tokyo at the time, actually. And uh, I tried, I had tried quitting. And uh, the cold turkey thing just did not do it for me, man. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. I just... I just found myself like stressing out and needing a thing but for me it was like the double like you have the oral fixation of like puffing on a cigarette and then you had the um, nicotine addiction and what as funny is I started smoking cigarettes I was 12 years old and 40 years old now oh wow wow I was yeah I was about that age when I first started smoking regularly and that was uh, that's not good that's not good. And, um, yeah, holy cow. So, yeah, that double, double addiction was the hard part for me. So, when a friend of mine, Zach, he introduced me to the, the vape. And he's like, yeah, man, it, it, like, actually, it's, like, a lot like smoking, but not smoke. Give it a go. So I was like, okay, I'm sold, full bore, sign me up. I'm spending money on smokes anyway, so I'll spend money on this to try. And I just, I bought into it, and and I did it. I did it, but I was on that for a while before I quit that. But I was able to um, wean off of the nicotine while I was on that, and then and then I quit that entirely after a trip to Japan. Funny story. So like I w Yeah, smoking sucks. I quit smoking because my last cigarette made me puke, so I went back to vaping. Yeah, see I I wouldn't I wouldn't recommend vaping except to quit smoking. <laughs> That's it. I mean w once you get on that then then it's like okay, get off of that as soon as you can sort of thing. That's uh, that's my ammo anyway. Is um, get yourself get yourself off the off the vape too. But yeah, so what what happened was uh, I kept weaning off the nicotine in the vape juice to the point where I was mixing like uh, I can't remember the milligrams. It was like 
three or whatever, the lowest one you could get. And I was mixing Definitely it with... Definitely muchly love to you, my friend. Stay with it at no smoking. Oh, yeah. I'm staying with that. No problem. I, I'm not turning back. And my, my biggest thing, too, is uh, being able to hang out with smokers and not want to smoke. And I've got there. I got there. So I'm, I'm proud of myself on that one. Um, but yeah, so I was mixing them half and half with zero nick to get like even lighter, like 1.5 nick. And then uh, we went to Japan and I packed a bunch of juice, but it, it wasn't enough for the trip. And they, they don't allow nicotine in their juice in Japan. So uh, essentially had to go zero nick at the end of my trip. And then by the time I got back, I went to my usual store and I was like, oh, can I get the flavor I always get? And they're like, we sold out. You're going to have to choose a new flavor. And I was like, do I choose a new flavor or do I choose not to do it at all? And I just went with the not do it at all thing. <laughs> that was it. And I was off of it. And I'm happy. I'm happy because it, it's, it's more money, more money in my pocket to buy keyboard stuff. <laughs> right now, I can, I can get the the keyboard goodies that I've always wanted, um, which just means more, more time, more time to sit and do these things. But I'm enjoying it. I'm enjoying it. Having a good time. But yeah, definitely getting off those stinky, stinky darries, man. If I could go back in time and never start, I would do that. That would be the ideal. But yeah, hindsight's twenty twenty, right? Am I right? Boy, do I miss Japan, though. Just thinking of that. Just thinking of that trip. I, th I think that was our last trip as well. Man, it's been too long. It's been... I am in need of help with getting medical supplies. Do you know where I'd be able to get free supplies? Walmart is charging me 90 a month and... I have no idea, my man. I have no idea. I haven't even been to the doctor in way too long. See, I'm a, I'm a working guy, so like, I don't know, I'm just, I'm so busy with working, and when I get home, I got the kids, and then for a long time I was doing content stuff, right? I mean, <laughs> it's funny I say that because I'm doing content right now, right? But um, this is just chill, and I'm, I'm really happy with, with this channel and what I'm doing now. Um, before it was like pretty involved stuff. I don't know if anyone in here right now was around for the maximum underdrive undertaking, but that was um, was pretty involved. Uh, I was a producer on that show and production, all of that. Big, big, big uh, amount of time every day. So. I haven't gotten around to seeing the dock for, <laughs> for anything, which I might want to do. So I'm, I'm almost at that age. I'm almost at that um, physical age. You know, that, that <laughs> the one exam every guy uh, does not look forward to. has to do I'm almost there next year actually next year is the big the big lordy lordy look who's 40 I I can't believe it though I just it blows my mind that's that's the age that I'm at I don't feel like going through a midlife crisis or anything like that but 
I'm just like, wow, that added up fast. Next, next thing you know, you're old. <laughs> you know? Uh, wow. It happens to the best of us, they say. I turned 40 in August. Nice. Congratulations, man. So, in August. So you're 1981. Is that right? I think that's right. Yeah, I'm a 1982 kid. I grew up on Commodore 64s and Nintendos. Man, I really, really want to get a Commodore 64. Like a, an original. I know they made the Mini, but that's, that's, no, forget that. An original Commodore 64 with the floppy floppy disk drives. I mean, I'm talking about like the proper like what were they? The four-inch floppies, the ones that were actually floppy, not the hard ones. But I think, oh my god. I wonder what I wonder what they I wonder what they're I going for. I spent my fortieth birthday in the hospital. Yup, one nine eight one. I have an original Commodore sixty four with a lot of games. Really? Oh my god! I'm jealous, my man. <laughs> I'm thoroughly jealous. Holy cow! Yeah, something else. Wow. You know what I need to do? I need to make make some moves over here. I wonder if I can do this on the fly. Let's see. Da -da -da -da. Got. It. I even have the original monitor for the Commodore 64. You have the original monitor. Whoa. And it still works. That's amazing. I wonder if I can move this over. Let me just check this out. Oops. I'm going to undo that. I think it's Alt. Yeah, that's what I'm doing. Still works, yes, I just got done playing Aliens for the Commodore 64 about two days ago. I beat the game and everything. That's awesome. I like this. So now, I'm going to come over here. I'm more in the picture. <laughs> there we go. That's a little better. I want to copy the transform on this, though. So, uh, copy transform. Let's go to the workbench 2. Transform. There we go. That's a little better. Just needed to move things around. That's a little better, right? Am I right? Ooh, I like it. Yeah, oh my god. 
I, I would love to have a, a, a classic Commodore 64. So one thing, okay, so this is the elusive, the elusive thing for me, right? So we had some, we had some games on the Commodore 64. We had, what was the one game? Um, something Sisters. It was a Mario ripoff and I loved it. But like, yeah, instead of a star, it was like a, like we, you'd run around and essentially jump on on Goombas, but instead of Goombas, there were owls. And instead of instead of a star, you would get like a little lightning bolt. And I mean, it was a total ripoff. And it was like the Something Sisters, and that was <laughs> instead of Mario Brothers, right? And that's to me that's hilarious. Um, but that that was a game that I had. And then I had Qbert, and what were some of the ones? Quest, Quest for Tires. Oh my God, I remember rage quitting so bad, and I was like four, <laughs> or whatever, right? <laughs> playing this game. Um, but the one elusive game for me was the GI Joe game. So we had a floppy disk with GI Joe on it, and it didn't matter. It was like corrupted somehow. And I would try to load it up, and it would always crash. And it didn't matter. For some reason, I don't know why. I was just a kid. I didn't know how how this stuff worked. So I always just try it anyway on different days. And I'd be like, maybe today it'll work. Because I recalled it working at one point. But the G.I. Joe game, and I always wanted to play it. And I never really, truly got to play the game still to this day but i still want to play the gi joe game on the great guiana sisters the great guiana sisters that's the one that's the one that's the mario ripoff <laughs> it's great it was fantastic it was so good i think they made a remake uh recently the great guiana sisters but it was just like Eh, <laughs> you know what I mean? It wasn't like, uh... It wasn't too much like the original. It was like something else entirely. But it was still a platformer. But, yeah. I want to play the original. I want that game, and I want... Quest for Tires. I have it. Oh my god. That's awesome. That's so cool. That's so cool. I'm jealous, man. I'm jealous. What's what's a Commodore 64 original one worth these days? It's got to be a ridiculous price. Okay, so I put these in here, but I didn't even did I leave the bases yet? I didn't. I'm going to take the springs back out. And the remake for Atari Jaguar. Oh, there's a remake of the uh, Great Guiana Sisters on Jaguar? No. Really? Because there was a cease and desist order from Nintendo because of that game. Like, Nintendo made sure that game, like, went off the market. Like, it's, it was gone. So, like, get, a, get an official release of it, like... I think you can get a ROM of it now and make a copy, but like if you have like a boxed boxed copy of it, that is worth some coin now. It's gotta be. <laughs> oh my god, that's so funny. What a blatant ripoff. So that was like the heyday. All I have is this piece of hard rock candy, but it tests not for eating, it's for looking through. They also remade <laughs> it for the Nintendo DS. What are you on about, Rompus? They made it for the DS. Oh, the, the remake. Yeah, the remake's like nothing like Mario. It's not a, it's not a ripoff of Mario. What are you talking about your hard rock candy? Lola lol. Lola lol. 
Yeah, Rampas, what are you talking about? Your hard rock candy. What are you doing at the moment, Rampas? Are you, uh... You kids off to bed now? You done with movie night? Oh, my... I think I have to cough one thing. Yeah, frog in my throat. What was that? That's as what the dude said in the movie. Oh. <laughs> oh yeah, hard rock candy. Kids sleep wife still watching. Ah, oh, still watching. Wow, you kids up late on a Friday night. Wow. That's something else. Yeah, my kids have been in bed for a few hours now. You got those kids that are going to be going to school? Like, yeah, my, my dad lets me stay up late. Kid been sleep. Oh, okay. He's <laughs> got that one kid in school. He's like, yeah, I got to. I watched a late night show. And you're like, what? I don't even know that existed. She not put her to bed. Oh, she's just sleeping on the couch. That's cute. Kids are funny. Right now, Daniel's at that age where he's, he's like a year and a half, right? Just it's actually Saturday morning, lol. Is it really? How late are we at? How late is it? Wow, yeah. It is. Oh boy. Yeah, movie night. We haven't done that in a while. Movie night is this, I don't know, it's, it's weird. Like, media has changed so much that, like, sitting down and watching a movie seems like a foreign thing anymore. It's like, media is always just like... 215, I'm in the morning. 215? So that puts you on the East Coast. No, not on the coast. But somewhere in eastern middle Middle East, <laughs> not quite the Middle East, but wait, did you say you said Arkansas before, didn't you? Like writing a letter. Yeah, it's like writing a letter. The whole like movie night thing. So like theaters are, I think, going to be a thing of the past at some point because. I mean, we don't even have one in my town. If I want to go to a movie theater, it's a whole event. I gotta drive to another city, right? We're not, we're not just going to the movies, man. Like, it's a big, a big, big to do just to go see a movie, and like. I remember when I was a kid, the movie would come out, and then it, it feel like it feel like forever before it was uh, released on VHS. Nowadays, it's like movies in theaters. It hasn't even finished its theatrical run, and it's already on DVD. <laughs> it's already ready to watch online. 
Jeez, that was that latest Scarlett Johansson movie, Black Widow. She she ended up suing them because they released it theatrical and on Disney Plus at the same time. When movies came out, people wore suits. They got dressed. It LL go back to that. Dude, what are you talking about? You talking about like the 1920s? Jesus. <laughs> Uh, unless you talk about the runway, like the red carpet screening of a movie or some something like that. That's funny. <laughs> wearing a suit. I ain't wearing no suit. I go see a movie. But I do miss yes. the. I always love how that text to speech says that. Yes. But, um, <laughs> I definitely miss the experience of going to the movies, you know, waiting for the movie. So you like, you, you go into the arcade for a little while and you hang out, you spend yes, some quarters. Yes, the Carcassar movie going B will be treat again. It would be a treat. I miss the popcorn. Popcorn. So... In Japan, we, we, every time we visit there, like, well, not every time, but occasionally we go to a movie, right? Especially with the kids. And this is the tragedy of seeing a movie in Japan. Now, I'll tell you what, the theaters are clean and they're comfortable. They're great. That's not a problem. That's actually great. But they don't have butter for the popcorn what what <laughs> they got popcorn and it's got like the buttery salty flavor to it but they don't have the butter to pump onto it to make it like slimy movie popcorn <sighs> that's hard to deal with man it's hard to deal with I want that disgusting, gelatinous, hot butter mess on my popcorn. <laughs> I need to have it. Oh, come to the United States. Oh, what? Well, here in Canada, here in Canada, we we got that at the theaters. It's good. I mean, it's not good for you, but it's good but yeah in japan now they just don't even serve it i guess people are like nah i don't want that for whatever reason <laughs> so good though man <laughs> uh i i love that i always ask for extra butter give me more of that give me more of it it's gross it's bad for me so I gotta have it. Oh, it's so terrible, but it's oh, it's so good. It's always the, it's always the worst things for you that just you enjoy the most. Like this stuff right here. But you know what? I've been going for a while. What I'm going. This is starting to get warm. It's like <laughs> two hours on a beer. I think I'm. I think I'm doing all right. On oh, that, the health, health-wise. I miss it though. I miss it. We used to go. See, I grew up. I grew up in a little town called Windsor, Ontario, Canada. And uh, we used to go out to this place called Silver Cities to go see movies. Yeah, at one point, it was like in the mall, the theater place. But then they opened up this big, big movie place. 
Silver City. Oh, they had one downtown too. I remember that. It was it was kind of a janky little tiny theater downtown. But yeah, they opened up Silver City, and it was like, bam, big. Every they had like twelve theaters, and each one of them was massive compared to like what we were used to, right? And when that that thing came to town, we'd go to that all the time. Every weekend, we're going to see something. I loved it. Just love movies. Absolutely love movies. It's just too bad they don't make any good ones anymore. Tell me in the tell me in the comments if I'm wrong and they have some good movies that come out. All I see all I see nowadays is remakes of good movies. <laughs> that are just like terrible, terrible bastardizations of the original work that have no no soul to them. They're just how, how do we take an old property that has a fan base and just basically make a made for TV movie from the 90s with more CGI and uh slap that name on it so there's some brand recognition you know what I mean I can't think of a good movie that's come out recently course been kind of out of the loop when it comes to movies I mean I hear about all the Marvel ones and I'm, I'm just I'm marveled out man I'm marveled out a couple weeks ago we had a movie night in the house and we watched that movie Shazam and that was funny I liked it because it, it felt like a piss take on the superhero genre like that kind of thing and it was you know I had a wholesome story feel uh, I like that. But, yeah, just, just superheroed out, my man. Superheroed out. You know, forever we're waiting for superhero movies to come out. They're like, oh my god, how good would it be if they made like a really good movie? And then Iron Man came out and it was like, wow, that's awesome. Oh my god, they're gonna tie it together with this other property. Holy, oh, they're gonna make the Avengers. Oh my god. And then there was the Avengers, and then Avengers 2, and Avengers 3 and 4. <laughs> and then it's like, oh, okay, can I just get like. Something that's not epic. Can I get just a, a good movie? A uh, drama? A, something like that? Detective story? Yeah, There's just no more, no more good original works. Not, not out of the mainstream anyway. online filmmakers that that's a new thing right so like this whole online indie filmmakers thing and i'm i'm really on board with it i really like it a lot honestly um i think that the only struggle with it though is that there's no there's no one place to go so online Online filmmakers, I think for me, it kind of reminds me of when you used to go to the, you used to go to the the video store, right, the rental shop, and you go looking for a VHS that you want to get, and you know, 
I used to go to the video store all the time to the point where I'd seen everything pretty much. <laughs> or I seen a, like you go enough you, you've seen all the new releases. You've seen everything on the new release. And then you're like, but I still want to watch a movie. I want to have my popcorn. I want to chill. And this was a thing before like before the internet really blew up. And so you'd go over to the the other aisle, right? Where they have older movies and then they have the movies that somebody made and just put a cover on it that looks like another movie that you know what I mean <laughs> they just have like a title that's like similar to a blockbuster movie but they just like threw it out there cheaply made and just hope people would mistake and go see that instead <laughs> Because <laughs> they think they're seeing the actual blockbuster movie. That was a whole, like, there's a whole market behind that. That's what it feels like looking for independent online, like, film stuff. It just feels like there's a whole lot of weeding through the junk, right? It's hard to find those gems. The gems do exist, though. But there's just a whole lot of samurai cop or whatever. <laughs> it's like really, really bad movies. And I don't fault I don't fault the directors because it's just hard, hard to make film. It's hard to make a good story. It's hard to make, and it's hard to bring people together to make these things happen. Like film production, I just find so fascinating. I just find it so fascinating to see like the ones that do come together and make good films. Like, I wonder how many iterations and failures they had before they actually came to making a good thing. Cause it's not easy. It's not easy. There's so many variables that can mess the whole thing up. You know? Like getting getting people together. Not only that, you when you're when you're making when you're making content, you you you're getting actors or whatever, right? You're getting people who have a certain amount of egocentrism to themselves, right? So they have their own ideas, and they have their own egos, and they bring that to the table. They don't leave that at home, you know? And yeah, doing creative, creative stuff with people is hard. So I, yeah, I can really feel for why so many productions end up being basically bad B movies <laughs> at the end of the day. That was a great story. Great idea. Yeah, poor and really bad implementation or whatever the case ends up being, right? So much of that. Man, I'm actually really enjoying this. I'm having a good time. Just, it's almost therapeutic, just talking to the live stream. Lubing some switches. So I'm, I'm hoping to get all this done not necessarily tonight, but it'd be nice to get it done like this weekend, I guess. Because then next weekend it would be it'd be fun to uh, do a stream of uh, taking the keyboard apart. So the deal the deal with the the whole keyboard thing is that. 
because I, I use it at work and I kind of need it. Like I can't, I really don't want to have, um, no keyboard at work for any amount of time. I really can't stand, um, using the laptop keyboard forget it yeah it's terrible so that being said if i take if i if i'm doing the keyb i'm doing this the switches swap the switch swap i'm gonna want to do it all in one weekend so that's ready to go back to work for Monday kind of thing. But man, it's a lengthy process. So when I did the old, the other switches, I, I was just chilling in the Discord while we're doing that. Again, I forgot to put the link to the Discord in the description. Might have to go edit that in a minute. Nice. Boop, boop. Boop, be doop. Almost halfway. <laughs> you get hours into it, and it only gets you only gets you a part of the way. But you know what? If you don't enjoy it, then that's just it's it. Yeah, it's not for you. It's not that. It's not your kind of hobby. You know what I mean? If uh. If that's not what you're looking to get into. Let's get over onto this mic. Ooh, sounds a little better, I'm sure. Sounds a little bit better. All right. You know what? I think I'm going to call it. I'm going to call it a night. For everybody that showed up and came out, thanks for coming by. Love having you here. Love chilling. Having to get into, just getting into what I'm getting into and seeing who's out there, out there in YouTube land, hanging out. Hopefully, we'll have some videos coming soon. I have some of those ideas that I was talking about earlier. And I like to shoot some videos talking specifically about those things. So, just want to get my thoughts together with that and then have a cohesive idea with that put that together and get that out there so hey thanks for tuning in guys thanks for coming out and uh we'll see you see you in the next one